Szanowni Państwo, witam Państwa serdecznie na kolejnej sesji, tym razem sesja pierwsza, naukowa, mikrobiomy i mykobiomy w badaniach naukowych. Podczas tej sesji gościmy przedstawicielkę Komisji Europejskiej, panią Magdalenę Gajdzińską, która z ramienia Komisji Europejskiej jest osobą odpowiedzialną za badania, za zagadnienia związane generalnie z mikrobiomami. Także bardzo serdecznie witam przedstawicielkę komisji i pozostałe panie prelegentki, z, które będą przedstawiane już przez prowadzących sesję naukową. Także życzę panu, państwu owocnej tutaj sesji i oddaję głos prowadzącym. Dziękuję. Dziękujemy. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it is my pleasure to chair this session together with Professor Aleksandra Obrempalska Stemplowska. This session will be devoted to various aspects of uh, my microbiome and mycobion. Uh, the presentation will contain uh, problems related to ecology and uh, I, I've ecology of plant and soil, and I'm sure that there will be very, very interesting and very uh, fruitful session. Uh, the first keynote speaker will be Professor Gabriela Berg, our pre precious guest of this conference from Technological University in Graz in Austria. Uh, let me uh, present a, sh a short biography of Professor Berg. Uh, uh, she studied biology, ecology and biotechnology at the universities in Rostock and Greifswald. Obtained her PhD in 1995 in microbiology from Rostock, Rostock University in Germany. In, 2000, in 2005, she became a full professor in environmental biotechnology at Graz University of Technology in Austri Austria. And in 2021, an additional professorship in Potsdam, Germany. Okay, let me uh, give some information in Polish. Uh, proszę Państwa, ten wykład jest realizowany przy uh, wsparciu finansowym gminy Lublin w ramach programu Visiting Professors in Lublin. Wykład w formie streamingu będzie ogólnodostępny dla mieszkańców Lublina. Uh, I would like uh, also to, to point out uh, that uh, it will be, uh, we will be very grateful to all speakers of this session to keep the time. When the time will be approaching, I will stand and give the sign, just the, let's say five minutes left to finish the lecture. Professor Berg, please, the floor is yours. Yes. So thank you very much. And it's, it's really a pleasure to be here and thank you very much for this invitation and organizing this very, very interesting conference. And after our two plenaries about the fungi and the plants, so I, we will now switch to the microbiome. And uh, I think I brought you here a picture where you can see uh, some microbes on the root. So they are inside of the root and outside there live more than people on earth. And I think it's, it's, it's really a convincing. I think I will switch to that mic. So I, yeah, because there is a light so much coming. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so the, the microbiome is really the sum of all microorganisms in, in one uh, environment. So it's also the fungi and the archaea as well. So because this is the first, and so my, uh, I, I will introduce you into the soil microbiome and the plant microbiome, but I will also go a little bit to the human microbiome as well and bring that all together in the frame of planetary health. So as requested. And uh, it was nicely introduced. I really enjoyed this art presentation. 
and for me it was a little bit the earth so how how it develops the evolution but also the anthropocene was visible so with that disturbance which we have and and this is exactly what we have we live in that uh, in that century of the anthropocene and this is characterized by already uh, being beyond the borders of our planet so you are all aware that we have the crisis, the biodiversity crisis, the nitrogen crisis, antibiotic crisis, climate, pollution and microplastics. And everything has a direct connection to the microbiome. And on the other hand, that means as well that also microbiome management can help to, uh, to cope these challenges which we have at the moment. And this is the idea of my presentation, to, to show you that, how we can do that. And uh, originally, for a long time, I working, was working on the plant microbiome uh, until I realized that the plant microbiome is embedded in, in, in the whole uh, microbiome circle and that uh, that it connects us but look on the global food losses so we we have a lot it's for the food and vegetables it's uh, 45 percent and for the roots and the tubers as well so uh, many people are looking on the field so what can can, can we change in the field that not all the fungi eat uh, one third of the world harvest as, it, as they are doing that for centuries. And uh, there's also this post-harvest area, uh, which, which is much more crucial and is widely ignored. So therefore, I also uh, included it a bit in my, into my presentation. So, and yeah, this is uh, the visualizing of the microbiome network and so we 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 really realized in the in the last 20 years uh, this is a time that uh, microbiome research is existing it was emerging from the field of microbial ecology and now it's really present in, in all different subjects and so we uh, realize that it's not only the soil microbiome it's really the soil microbiome uh, going to the plant microbiome and then reaching also the, our gut microbiome as well. So, and uh, due to the importance of, of these connections, or I, I, I mean to, to look on the whole cycle is a little bit challenging, but what we can really do is to look on, on, on different connections. So, and this is also, the, these are the sections of my talk. First, the uh, soil plant, then a little bit on the post-harvest, only to mention that, that this is really crucial. And here is a lot of research, and then also to the foot-gut uh, connection. So let's start uh, with, with the plant microbiome. And here I, I have, three examples for you. So the first, this is, is the alpine environment or the native plants in, in natural ecosystems. And uh, I'm studying that since uh, my time in, at Rostock University to understand the plant microbiome in, in nature and, and the, f uh, the entire f functioning. Because if you go uh, or if you start into the field, so there it's already reduced and, and for example, a lot of fungi don't uh, exist in, in the agricultural ecosystem. So, and then I will move uh, to, to, to oilseed Pumpkin, this is an example from Styria, where I live now. And uh, so this is our main crop there. We are producing uh, a very good oil out of from this, and this is very tasty and healthy. And at, at least I, I have a worst case example for you, and th this is from the RSC. So starting with the alpine uh, flowers, these are normally very nice excursions, what you can do. And this is one hour away from Graz in the alpine environment. 
and uh, we were interested in uh, looking into the seed microbiome of these alpine plants. And this is a, a, a very beautiful and highly diverse meadow. And of course, we expected that these plants, here, here are the ones which we studied, they, they grow together there for centuries and they will share a lot of the microbiome because uh, it's the same soil. So, and when we analyzed them, we were really surprised because what we found is, first point, an incredible diversity inside of these very, very, very small seeds. So it was, was challenging to, uh, to sample these plants. Very, they are very small and, and the seeds even smaller. So all together we found uh, around 12,000 different OTUs, which is a bit uh, a microbial species, but they shared only 11. So, and, and this we have not expected, that it's really so unique and that the, the seed microbiome also contribute to soil microbial diversity because the, the soil and terrestrial ecosystem is really the exoskeleton and the seed uh, treasure chest for all microbes. So, and it was similar for, for fungi and for archaea. And we were really surprised also when we looked on the list of, of the fungi because this was like a European list of plant pathogenic fungi. So they are all associated also with the seeds of these native plants, but for sure in nature they have a completely different function. For example, degrading the, the seed shells. So, and it's, it's the reduced biodiversity and all these anthropogenic impact what uh, makes them then to, to the pathogens. So, and we could also visualize the microorganisms inside of, of these seeds. I'm, uh, I'm always enjoying also this visualization because it convinced sometimes much more than uh, to, to see only the DNA, although it can be beautiful as we have seen. So, and uh, there is also a, a proof of, of principle what we have done here because these Gensiana seeds, they were uh, germinate under gnotobiotic conditions. And you can see that the root part is here colonized by a highly diverse microbiome. So, and, and, and this is what we learned that there is a vertical transmission of, uh, of approximately 50% of the microbiome. And, and then there is a horizontal uh, acquisition from the soil microbiome. And this makes a lot of sense, transporting the beneficial microbes from one generation to the other. And on the other hand, also to adapt the plants to the, to the new environment. So it's, it's to be honest, it's like for, for human as well. So, and and uh, we figured out it's now for all organisms. But looking on, on the conclusion, I mean, if, if you look on our crop seeds, which, which are sterilized, which are produced only on specific sites in the world and then stored for a long time, they have a much, much reduced diversity. And uh, this is what I would like to show you now. So the impact also of breeding and the impact of fertilization and, and, and agriculture on, on, on the seed microbiome. So, uh, and therefore I selected these pumpkin because I mean, normally our crop, all our crops, they are domesticated for a very, very long time. And it's very difficult also to find out the breeding lines all over the world. So, but here, this pumpkin, it, it was a mutant and it was found 100 years ago in Styria. So the place in south, in, in south uh, eastern Austria, not that far from here. 
So, and the farmer was very intelligent, clever farmer, and he thought maybe I can do something with that because uh, this, they, uh, the pumpkin lost the wooden seed shells. So, and what he has done then is he roasted it and then he produced the oil and then he thought it's, it's really good. And so we have here only a domestication and breeding period for 100 years. And we have a cooperation with these breeders. And uh, so we have a clear breeding line and we have all the genetic information from, from the plants. So, and, and, and then we, we studied uh, the seed microbiome, the rhizosphere microbiome, and the soil microbiome. And what we found out is, uh, first of all, again, here uh, I would like to start with, uh, with the microbes. This is all these three pictures, it's inside of the seed, and you can see how the microbes are sitting and uh, uh, surrounding the cotyledon and uh, then colonizing also the seedling. And interestingly, what we found out is as higher the diversity within the seeds, as more resistant they are. So, and this was a surprise, and it also surprised the breeders a lot. But due to the fact that it's such a small company and, and they, they, they are well educated by our university, so they start really microbiome assisted breeding. So, and uh, this is a summary. So, what we found out for, uh, for the breeding, because normally the breeders, they are looking for big fruits, big crops, <laughs> so for high productivity, and also they look for resistance. So, and uh, there are a lot of examples now. I mean, these are from our groups, but they are much more from, from other groups that, uh, for example, if, if you breed for resistance, then you also pay a, a price of diversity. So, and there is always a correlation between the microbiome because the breeders shape much more the microbiome than, uh, than the phenotype of the plants. So, this was also a surprise. And uh, I would like to bring your attention to the cancer. This is also a new perennial grass. So the future of agriculture, we hope that we can integrate much more perennials because they, they are more sustainable. And uh, they have now uh, 10 breeding cycles uh, of, of that cancer. And uh, now we have seen that in parallel, they reduce the diversity of uh, the seed microbiome. So it will... Uh, have the price, the, the larger seeds, uh, that they are then more susceptible to pathogens. And I mean, the conclusion is, of course, that we have to consider the holobion, not only the plant, it's both. It's a plant microbiome and uh, the co-evolved uh, thing. So, and my last example, this is a worst case example. This is an RLC which disappeared in the last 30 years. And uh, so there were a lot of restoration efforts from international NGOs, but all of them failed. But fortunately, there, there are some plants, one survived. Uh, but, uh, but these worst case scenario or environmental disaster it was is a product from intense agriculture because the former Soviet Union decided to uh, to switch the desert into intense cotton production in Uzbekistan and in, uh, in, in 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 Kazakhstan and so and they used the the river of the Amodaya and Sirdaya uh, for intense uh, production and applied a lot of pesticides so that this dried out RSC basin is really full of, of, of the residues. And uh, the people living there, they, they are really sick. So, and we thought it would be interesting to look on the plant microbiome, how it looks like, because it's also a little bit a future scenario of our planet. 
So, and, and this we have done, and we used also a succession gradient of these Zoeda acuminata. And we found very, very clear results, which I have not expected. So, in, 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 in the early revegetation, so there were only Archaea fulfill, for, fulfilling the uh, function of the plant microbiome. I think this was one of the first examples showing that, that the plants can survive by Archaea, but it's much more difficult for them. And under better conditions, then they are completely replaced by the bacteria. So the ecosystem is restoring. And uh, this study, it was also in parallel, it was our first uh, study on the viruses. So I think uh, they also belong to the microbiome and they are the drivers of the microbiome. And we could clearly show that there are very, very clear pattern of these viruses. So they, they, they are following and there, there was a complete uh, a shift so and they have also shaped a lot of the plant microbiome so I, I think the, the viruses they are drivers of the plant microbiome which we have really to consider so and uh, this is a summary of the first and this was also the longest part of my talk uh, so what we see, the uh, signature of the plant microbiome in the Anthropocene is a shift from plant beneficial bacteria to plant pathogens. So the diversity decreased, the evenness decreased, and the specificity decreased. This is an opinion paper based on a lot of publications. It's not, not only ours, so there is a lot of uh, other work. And so we have more dysbiotic microbiomes. We have a, a prevalence of fast-growing organisms, the so-called R strategist. And we have a lot of hypermutators. And we have uh, increasing antimicrobial resistance. And this is similar also to the human microbiome. So uh, I think we, we have really to look on the, on, on the whole microbiome and and see how it changed. So, and there's always a question, what is a healthy microbiome? And uh, this is, I think, now clear that it's a functional diversity is what matters. So the functional diversity of the plant microbiome, and this is also the same for the, for the human microbiome. So what we need to avoid uh, all these pathogen, these multi-resistant pathogens which emerge uh, everywhere is microbiome management. So a very short excursion to the, to the post-harvest microbiome uh, because uh, here we selected the apple and this was a citizen science project with kids. So and we thought we, we have to convince them that the microbiome contains a, a lot of beneficial bacteria. So it's, it's the shift from considering bacteria and fungi and archaea as pathogens to that the microbiome means health. So, and, and, and this was what we have done uh, with, with the kids. And so we were also surprised about the results because we have not expected that high diversity in the pulp. So, and uh, then we also studied the impact of storage and in that global agriculture, which was definitely a mistake uh, because uh, the apples, they, they, they are stored for a long time. It's, it's one year until they go to the supermarket, sometimes two years. They look the same, but uh, the microbiome is not uh, the same anymore. And so we have even a storage specific uh, resistome. So, and there is an uh, increasing, um, there are in the, the clinical relevant uh, uh, antimicrobial resistance genes are increased. So this is the only possibility to, to determine the age of apples is to, to analyze the microbiome because it looks completely the same. So, but this, I think, because we are eating that, 
is 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 really important to consider, and uh, in that post uh, post harvest period, also there are much more chemicals applied than in in the field, and so but most of the people are looking or or try to to make this part uh, more healthier and sustainable. So is that really important for us? Therefore, there is a new research direction emerging, and this is the exposome research. So what the people from medicine um, saw that, I mean, of course, in within the genome, there are some marker and uh, there, there are crucial points to predict uh, diseases but it's much more the environment. So, and, and therefore they established also the cohorts. So these are children, then thousand babies born, and then they look, they are looking for them during their whole life cycle. So, and, and there are these very big EU projects now studying the, uh, these cohorts and f to try to figure out the impact on on environmental factors on the microbiome uh, on, on 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 human health. So, and it's our it's our turn uh, to be involved with the human mi with the microbiome. And uh, so, the first step was that we were looking for uh, for the foot microbiome, and we thought our app the apples were really ideal to figure that out. And there is always the argument now, nah, but we cook that, and and the the microorganisms they cannot survive. So there's a stomach pH of two, but now we know it's it's colonized, and as endophytes they survive well. So, but they also survived uh, the shredding, the boiling, and the preserving, even the drying. Although we see a shift, so but in in in, in the sterilized food, and, and this is for, for example, uh, now the parents uh, giving to their kids these scratchies, or don't know how, how it's named in, in Poland, so, and, and think that they are doing some, something good, but uh, the, the kids, they really uh, need also the microbiome, because in the first three years, uh, they assemble the microbiome, and and this is really crucial that they get enough diversity from the environment. So, and uh, it is very challenging to to show that really these plant associated microbes establish in the gut, and 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 they are uh, can survive. This is really challenging to do that. Uh, because you you have to convince then the people to eat for a certain period of time only this, but they are also different because one is doing exercise and and the other is doing something else. So and th therefore we have done here we analyzed all the metagenomes which are available in the public data set and ours as well. So and the first point is. There is a significant uh, overlap of the human gut microbiome and the food and vegetables. This is the inner circle. So in, in pinkish, this is uh, the humans and the food and vegetables is in blue. So and uh, we could show by this anal analysis that it's 2.2 uh, on average of the proportion which is originating from foods and vegetables. But it's even more convincing to analyze the data from the American Gut Project. So this is a, a very, very large data set. It's also, I think it's, it's a, the biggest uh, citizen science project which, which we have and the people they give everything also how much uh, veggies they are consuming. And so the, the, the veg vegetarian and the vegan people, they have significantly higher uh, plant-associated microbes in their gut, up to 30%. So they are really, really crucial. So, and uh, uh, this is uh, then the last summary is that 
there is that connection. I hope that I convinced you from soil to the plant and, and then during the post-harvest period we have the change and then also to, to the human. And, and this we have to consider also if we are doing something for agriculture that we are at least we are eating that. And uh, so it's not only the big pumpkin, so it's, it's also the adipositas, which, uh, which is resulting from that. And there is a lot of, uh, uh, of evidence that there is exactly this link. So, and what we have to do is biocontrol, of course, but also microbiome management. There are very good examples for that long-term examples like fecal transplant from the Chinese medicine since 3,000 years. It's until now very successful, success rate of 96%. And the interesting thing is that also here, it is completely in parallel. So if you want to uh, control the health of a plant, of an animal, or of, a, of, of humans. So you, you, you have to change the abiotic conditions or you can add the microbiome, single strains or whatever. So and uh, as one example, so we have also a long-term collaboration with a sugar beet seed company. And so what we have done for them is uh, to develop a port portfolio for uh, for healthy sugar beets and uh, from it started from protection towards abiotic stress, biotic stress until post-harvest. But it's even, even much more what we have to do. So la last year uh, we, uh, together with, with 40 other co-authors, we published that article. And these are ecologists working with wildlife and corals and, 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 and natural ecosystems. And uh, before of that, I was not aware how sick our ecosystems are already. Are, but we have seen it also with the COVID, with the bats. So if there, the pressure is too, the abiotic pressure is too high, and uh, the biodiversity, the microbial diversity is is going down. So then we will have a lot of outbreaks in the future. And it's not only humans, it's not only our crops, it's also our ecosystems and and the organisms. And uh, therefore, we have to understand this. So, and uh, I think there are a lot of teachers here, and what we have done is uh, a MOOC, so this is an uh, open access online course, and it's, uh, we, we are using it for teaching our students to the microbiome, so there are six chapters, six lessons, but you can also do it yourself or give it to your kids, so, uh, but I would like to advertise this a little bit. And uh, this is my last slide. So it's, of course, it's not my work alone. So it's, it's, a, whole, it's a whole group. And uh, this was last month in May. So there were also some colleagues with, uh, with us. And I'm perfectly in time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Berg, for a very interesting and inspiring lecture. However, I'm very sorry, but, but we don't have time for discussion. So I invite uh, everybody or interested people to, to, to find the time during the break. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.